the 16th of January, 1599, a funeral took place at Westminster Abbey in London. When the coffin was laid to rest, a line of poets clutching eulogies they had written threw their poems and their pens into the tomb after it. They had lost a hero. This was a man who had changed literature forever, and he did it with one poem. But what a poem. A gentle light was pricking on the plain, clad in mighty arms and silver shield, wherein old dints of deep wounds did remain, the cruel marks of many a bloody field. Yet armors till that time did he never wield, his angry steed did chide his foaming bit as much disdaining to the curb to yield. Full jolly knight he seemed, and fair did sit, as one for knightly jousts and fierce encounters fit. The poem is called The Fairy Queen, and its author is Edmund Spencer a lowly civil servant who had climbed his way up the greasy pole of Elizabethan society. And for me, it's one of the most exciting works of literature ever written. I'm Dr. Yanina Ramirez. I'm a social and cultural historian, and I've been fascinated by this unfinished masterpiece ever since I first read it as a teenager. Why? Because nothing about this poem is as it seems. Its language may sound otherworldly. Its cast of Arthurian knights and fairies might smack of fantasy. But look deeper and you'll find something even more intriguing. This is a deeply subversive book. It begins with a sense of optimism and order, but underneath the ornate poetry lies a society gripped by political upheaval, violence and religious turmoil. And as this turmoil overtook Spencer's own life, the poem itself turned into something much darker, chaotic, and emotionally complex. Nothing like this had been seen before, and I don't think we've seen anything quite like it since. There may be other contenders, but for me, this is the book that catapulted English literature into the modern age. In the summer of 1580, a young English civil servant travelled to Ireland to begin a new life across the sea. On the surface, it was a plum posting. Private secretary to the Lord Deputy of Ireland himself. But some historians have argued that he was fleeing from a mess of his own making because the precocious, aspiring poet had written a satire that had landed him in hot water. The young civil servant was Edmund Spencer, and the poem was Mother Hubbard's Tale. But this was no little ditty about fetching a bone for a dog. It was something much more provocative. In it, he pokes fun at influential members of the royal court, portraying one as a bumbling ape and another as a sly fox. Of course, he never actually names anyone directly. 
that would be far too dangerous. But one courtier in particular gets mocked especially. The powerful William Cecil, Lord Burley. It was a potentially career-ending mistake. We'll never know just how much this bruising encounter affected Spencer's decision to leave for Ireland. But one thing was very clear. If he thought a quiet life in the civil service awaited, he was sorely mistaken. When Edmund Spencer arrived here in the 16th century, Ireland was gripped by one of the bloodiest periods in its history. By 1580, Ireland had undergone centuries of occupation, first by the Norman Earls, and then by successive Tudor and Elizabethan forces. Wave after wave of invasion had already created a confused, conflicted nation, and now religion had been thrown into the mix. After the Reformation in England, the Protestant faith became the official religion of state. The Elizabethan government was determined to export this brand of Christianity across the Irish Sea. In response, pockets of resistance sprang up all across Ireland, from indigenous Catholics to old Anglo-Norman settlers and what had begun as a series of tit-for-tat raids and counter-raids escalated into something far more vicious and deadly. Spencer found himself thrust into a chaotic world of clashing religious loyalties, ancient traditions and shockingly brutal violence. And in the midst of all this horror, he sat down and wrote one of the most beautiful poems in the English language. Sadly, Spencer's handwritten manuscripts no longer survive, but buried in the archives of the University Library at Cambridge are extremely rare copies of the very first edition of this important poem. And here it is. Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. This is a really exciting moment for me. I have been obsessed with this poem since I first read it as an undergraduate student. I can't believe I'm in the presence of such a precious 400-year-old object. The poem is divided into six books, each one following a knight who has been sent on a quest by Gloriana, the Fairy Queen, betrothed to Prince Arthur. It's a mythic landscape of elves, nymphs and lonely castles, and even to the Elizabethan reader it would have seemed a little quaint and old-fashioned. Even the language Spencer uses is deliberately outdated and archaic. So fair, and thousand, thousand times more fair she seemed, when she presented was to sight, and was eclad for heat of scorching air, all in a silken camis lily white, purfled upon with many a folded plight, which all above besprinkled was throughout, with golden aigulets that glistered bright, like twinkling stars, and all the skirt about was hemmed with golden fringe. Elizabethans wouldn't have talked like this, but by writing in this style, Spencer is drawing on a well-established literary tradition of Romance literature, that stretched right back to the 10th century. And it's what he does with this tradition that is just so revolutionary. Mm -hmm. 
Spencer took the familiar world of Arthurian chivalry and courtly love and thoroughly subverted it. Each character is loaded with meaning, and at the heart of this epic is a deeply symbolic marriage between the past and the future. The fairy queen of the poem is of course meant to be Queen Elizabeth I, and by using her marriage to Prince Arthur as the framework for the whole poem, Spencer is lending Elizabeth's politically insecure dynasty a mythic continuity and credibility through the Arthurian legend. With this book, Spencer is constructing a narrative that needs to be decoded before it can be understood. And helpfully, he tells us just how to do it. Dr. Richard Danson Brown is an expert on Spencer's writing and thinks that the key to understanding this epic poem lies in the letter that was included at the end of the first edition. He wrote it to Sir Walter Raleigh and it's a letter which basically explains the whole intention behind the poem. Why did he write it to Raleigh? Basically, at this stage in 1590, Raleigh is a really important courtier. He's one of Elizabeth's favourites, and he's something of a Renaissance man. So, in a sense, by putting this letter in the Fairy Queen, uh, Spencer is hitching his star to Raleigh's. Mm, he's backing this very important, influential person. Right, yeah. absolutely. And what he does here is he gives a kind of explanation of what's happening in the poem. So this is just the first three books of The Fairy Queen. What the letter as a whole tells us is that his plan is that the final poem will be a full 12 books. Gosh, right. And he never gets round to the full 12, no, but that's the intention. He never gets round to that. And in many ways, The Fairy Queen is a massive poem as we have it. It's six and a bit books. <laughs> a 12 book poem would have been truly humongous. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what, what the letter is doing is outlining the plan of the poem as a whole. And he does this through a series of really interesting phrases and words. The one that I'm particularly fond of is he describes it as being a continued allegory or a dark conceit. <laughs> The Fairy Queen is a puzzle book of symbols and codes, of hidden meanings and subtexts. It reflects the world in which it was written, a world full of metaphor and elaborate representation. This is a painting of Queen Elizabeth I, the Fairy Queen herself, Gloriana. This one's known as the rainbow portrait and the whole image is composed of a number of symbols. So you can see across her cloak there are eyes and ears painted. This is because like God she can see and hear everything and here on her arm there's a beautiful coiled embroidered snake symbolizing her knowledge and wisdom. Today, we might struggle to decode such an image, but to the informed Elizabethan viewer, its message would have been loud and clear. Like this painting, the Fairy Queen is a work of art that needs to be unpicked and unlocked. And to do that, the reader needs to come armed with an astonishing amount of knowledge. The kind of knowledge that only an educated person of the time could hope to attain. 
Spencer attended university here at Pembroke College in Cambridge. The fact that he came here at all is pretty remarkable. Unlike most of his peers, Spencer wasn't born into money. His father was probably a lowly tradesman, and records here show that he came as a sizer, which means that he had to work to fund his studies. From nowhere, he'd secured for himself the finest education in the country, and he certainly didn't waste his time. Spencer would have read the works of classical writers like Virgil and Ovid, but he also became fascinated by English authors like Chaucer and with French Romantic poetry. The young Edmund would absorb all these influences like an intellectual sponge and later put them to work to create something entirely new. It wasn't just the way Spencer fused these influences that was unique, it was also his style of writing. He wanted to create a style that set him apart from others, something that would make him stand out. Professor Simon Palfrey has been exploring his signature technique. What he does is he, he kind of constructs his own stanza form. Now, the, the, this stanza form is, is known as a Spencerian stanza because it is unprecedented. His crucial thing is to make a, a stanza of nine lines. Right. You can take pretty much any stanza. Mm -hmm. um, here's one from, from book three. Mm -hmm. Daily they grow and daily forth are sent into the world it's to replenish more. Yet is a stock not less an ed, nor spent, but still remains an everlasting store, as it at first created was of yore. For in the wide womb of the world there lies, in hateful darkness and in deep horror, and huge eternal chaos which supplies the substances of nature's fruitful progenies. It shows very clearly the kinds of techniques Spencer uses. Uh, you've got the, the four rhymes there, sent, more, spent, store. Right, A, B, A, B. A, B, A, B. Now that seems to be a self-sufficient unit mm. um, of, of poetry. But then you get the, the crucial fit, and it's the fifth line in the Spencer, Spencer stanza, which is the crucial one, right. which is the hinge point, because you've got four above and four below, and the fifth line is the pivotal line, literally, mm. in the stanza. Spencer plays with the rhyming pattern of each stanza, repeating the rhythm of the words back and forth. It creates a sense of wandering through the text. For every door that closes, another opens. So why do you think then that Spencer writes in this, this very unusual way? I think, I think he writes in this way because of his ambition for the work. The Spencerian stanza, because of its forward and backward rhythms, because of the fact that it ends in a way that begs further supplements and is, is definitively incomplete, it means that the stanza itself is an embodiment of the idea of a quest which can never quite be finished. And the poem is never quite finished. Each book is in some fundamental way unfinished. You reach an end which is not an end. It somehow speaks for the sort of the sleeplessness of Spencer's art and, and, and imagination. This intricate style, with its nine lines and strict rhyming pattern, is fiendishly difficult. It has inspired and challenged some of the greatest poets who ever lived, including the likes of Byron, Keats and Wordsworth, all of whom would write poems in this style to prove their ability. The Spenserian stanza became a poetic test of skill. But while those that came later 
wrote maybe one or two poems in this style. Spencer managed to keep it going for an impressive 35,000 lines. So what was it all for? Could it be that this epic poem is little more than an intellectual exercise for the amusement of his peers? Or was it to achieve something else entirely? In 1590, Edmund Spencer published the first three books of The Fairy Queen. It was a full decade since he had left England for Ireland, and court life must have seemed like a distant memory. But with this book came the chance for him to turn his fortunes around, and he knew exactly who to dedicate it to. Gloriana, the fairy queen herself, Queen Elizabeth I. It certainly got him noticed, and even though he had barely started on his 12-book epic, he was soon invited to an audience with the Virgin Queen. An impressive achievement for a commoner who'd had to serve tables to fund his education. By all accounts, the encounter went well. We've no record of exactly what the Queen said about the poem but she clearly felt its poet deserved a reward. Spencer was granted a pension of 50 pounds, a decent amount in a country where the average wage was little more than five pounds a year. His contemporaries began to refer to him as a laureate poet. His triumphant return to the royal circle seemed secured. Well, not entirely. In the same year that Spencer was granted his pension, he also published a collection of poems, possibly to cash in on his success. This collection included a little number from Spencer's back catalogue, Mother Hubbard's Tale. Ten years earlier, this very same poem may have been behind his hasty relocation to Ireland. Edmund Spencer clearly hadn't learnt his lesson. Perhaps we can put it down to Spencer's naivety about court life. Or perhaps he thought his favour with the Queen made him untouchable. In reality, he was anything but. His old enemy, Lord Burley, made sure that, once again, copies of the poem were seized and destroyed. And Spencer found himself, once again, locked out of court. Frustrated, Spencer returned to Ireland to finish his poem. And as his fortunes changed, so did the work itself. What we've got here are two editions of the Fairy Queen that were published during uh, Spencer's lifetime. So the first edition is the 1590 here, and here we've got the 1596 version. And there's an intriguing difference between them in the way the third book ends. Mm. The original ending, the most beautiful, fantastic ending of the third book, comes where the female knight Britomart has just rescued Amoret, who's been tortured by this enchanter, and she delivers poor Amoret back to Scudamore. And there's this incredible passage which describes Scudamore and Amoret embracing. Oh, I'm have a read of that. So it's here, isn't it? Yeah. Lightly he clipped her, twixt his arms twain, and straightly did embrace her body bright, her body late the prison of sad pain, now the sweet lodge of love and dear delight. 
But she, fair lady, overcommon quite of huge affection, did in pleasure melt. And in sweet ravishment poured out her sprite. No word they spake, nor earthly thing they felt. But like two senseless stocks in long embracement dwelt. It's really beautiful stuff, isn't it? It's stunning. Mm. And the next stanza goes on to describe them as being like the hermaphrodite. So it's an image of almost perfect psychological and erotic fusion mm. between these characters, a real happy ending. Yeah, great sense of resolve where everything's come together. That's right. And then when you go forward to 1596, that happy ending disappears. Mm. He's taken it out completely. So Britomart and Amoret come out of the castle but Scudamore has already gone off right. into the distance. So what we've got here, we've got books one to three that seem all lovely and finished, but when he goes to add the next three books to bring it up to six, yeah. he, he changes this ending, he, he changes the resolve in it. Yeah, and this is one of the major questions for Spencerians. Why does he make this change? What's happened between 1590 and 1596 to make this change necessary. It wasn't just Spencer's rejection from court that had changed his outlook. Ireland had descended even further into a bitter and bloody conflict with no clear winner and no end in sight. As a senior civil servant, Spencer had benefited by acquiring confiscated properties from rebel landowners, but as the war raged on, his position became even more precarious. One of the most important properties was here, in the beautiful but isolated countryside outside of Cork. And it wasn't just important to Spencer, I think, this is one of the most important locations in the history of English literature because it was here that Spencer wrote The Fairy Queen, Kilcolman Castle. The castle is little more than a ruin now, but when Spencer arrived here two years before he published the first edition of his poem, he set about establishing a fortified outpost, embracing his new role as a colonial landowner. Dr Andrew King from the University College Cork knows the location very well. And how do you think Spencer felt about the Irish people around him? I think there was a, a considerable ambivalence he does express you know, great interest in, in the culture, the countryside, um, and yet he also does clearly present the Irish as a savage people. That's, that's to put it frankly, that's how he, how he presents them. Do you think when Spencer publishes the second edition of The Fairy Queen in 1596 that he's lost faith in the um, Elizabethan enterprise in Ireland. Absolutely, I think he's he's completely disillusioned in um, the possibility of not only an Elizabethan project in Ireland, but I think more philosophically, or if you like, more abstractly, he's disillusioned in any human efforts yeah. to achieve stability. The whole book was posited on, you know, achieving a kind of stability, documenting it, documenting it, nailing it down, and, and the realisation that he can't believe in it. It's a complete switch in tone, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it really is, it really is, and that's, that to me is the brilliance of the work. As I've said before, it's intellectual honesty. 
the war that had been raging around Spencer as he wrote finally began to close in. Two years after the second edition of The Fairy Queen was published, rebel forces attacked his castle. Spencer was forced to flee for his life. And legend has it, he escaped via a secret tunnel somewhere near here, just a few hundred yards from the castle. As he emerged, he must have known that his world had completely collapsed. As if to compound the tragedy, it's thought that the original manuscripts of the Fairy Queen were lost in the flames. Driven out of court, mired in a failing colonial enterprise and now homeless, Spencer was forced to confront the fact that everything he believed in had fallen far short of the ideal he'd created. Defeated, he returned to London and died there just a month later, in January 1599. But that isn't the end of the story. Among his papers, Spencer's friends found a final book of the Fairy Queen, Book 7. And it contains what is, for me, one of the most powerful scenes in the whole work. Only a few stanzas of the final book remain. They're known as the Cantos of Mutability, and the story they tell takes place on Galtimore Mountain, which dominates the skyline between the counties of Limerick and Tipperary. The mountain right in the heart of Ireland is christened Arlo Hill, and it's the scene of an epic battle between the giantess Mutability and the god Jove. In the poem, Mutability, who represents chaos and change, clashes with Jove, who represents order. The two sides fiercely argue over who has supremacy. When it's over, Mother Nature, who has been watching the events unfold, concludes that while change is a powerful force, it's only part of a broader process. Ultimately, the only true constant is eternity. Then gin I think on that which nature said, of that same time when no more change shall be, but steadfast rest of all things firmly stayed upon the pillars of eternity, that is, contrary to mutability. For all that moveth doth in change delight, but thenceforth all shall rest eternally, with him that is the god of Sabbath height. Oh, that great Sabbath god, grant me that Sabbath sight. I think this is an incredibly beautiful and powerful book. For its time, it was revolutionary by fusing allegory and symbolism with the epic legends of Arthurian chivalry, Spencer was creating something entirely new, a kind of poetry that would inspire generations of writers for hundreds of years to come. In the end, Spencer is saying that only two things really matter, God and eternity. They're the words of a man who's been forced to question everything he believed in, including his own great project. Perhaps he thought it was a failure. I think he succeeded in more ways than he will ever know.
If you want to dig deeper into Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen or the other books in this series, then go to bbc.co.uk slash secret life of books and follow the links to the Open University. Next tonight on BBC4, a tale of courage and ingenuity, but how much of it is true? Martin Shaw investigates in Dam Busters Declassified, and then a political confrontation and a surprise at a life drawing class. Life is never dull when you're living close to the edge. Our brand new series continues at 10.